welcome Dave Mason. Thank you for uh, joining me today on this um, lovely sunny day in Wellington, actually. So you're a, you're a Wellington hypnotherapist like me. Yes, I am. Up a hut, actually. How many years have you been uh, in hypnotherapy and what sort of got you into hypnosis? I've been in hypnotherapy certainly more than 20 years. I must be getting over 25. I got into hypnotherapy like everyone else. I wanted to fix myself. I was working in Victoria University. I had to finish my PhD and I couldn't get it done. It was embarrassing. I was the smartest man in the building and I could not sit down and settle my PhD. This was a big deal. If I didn't pass, my career was over. That was it. It, was finished. it couldn't be more important. I would have nothing to do. And yet every day I got down and I checked my email and I looked at the internet and I just wasted my life. At the same time, I was conscious a lot wrong with me. I didn't get on terribly well with people. I, I felt anxious a lot of the time. And I decided that I, I had to do something radical. So I sold everything I owned, believe it or not. And I went to Queen Street in Auckland. I bought a small flat next to the Central Library. And I spent a year reading and reading and reading to find out what the hell was wrong with me. I discovered something called NLP. And I tried some of that. And I thought it was great. I, I, really, I spent about four months studying every aspect of NLP, buying all the courses, doing the stuff. And then it finally dawned on me that most of NLP was actually nonsense. It didn't work. A lot of it, they had no theory behind it at all. It still has no theory. It just says use these techniques. But that was, I don't care about that. That's fine. But then I discovered that a lot of the stuff that was saying that people speak in uh audio metaphors or visual metaphors, that, that, it just isn't true. And so I thought, why does it work? And I discovered that the things that actually work are hypnosis, which is embedded in NLP. And so about 5% of, of NLP actually works, and that's the hypnosis bit. So I decided to go and get a course. And I, I went into a, a course in Auckland by a guy called Roger Saxelby. And of the kind of 12, 14 people on the course, I was the only one there who had no intention of becoming a hypnotist or a hypnotherapist. I was there to try and find out what's wrong with me. I later discovered that actually all the other 13 were also there for the same reason, but they didn't bother mentioning it. Well, that's okay, that was an insight to me. Now, when I was studying this, I was very fortunate I couldn't go for the full-time course. I could only go for weekends. And so I'd go every Saturday, Sunday, and then have a week off and do Saturday. So we did this for some number of weeks, 14, 18, something like that. And for me, this is wonderful. I'd get taught something, and I'm an academic, so I'd go back to the library, I'd check it, I'd look it up, I'd test it out, I'd do stuff, and I'd go back and become a real nuisance the following Saturday, saying, well, this didn't happen, and that, what about this? But this was a wonderful education in getting me to try these things. And what I discovered is that hypnosis is an immensely powerful. And the second thing I discovered was I'm actually quite good at it. Because I had been a lecturer, I've been used to talking to people, I'm used to thinking my feet, I've been used to a very good visual memory and so on. And this is exactly what was needed for plain vanilla hypnosis. And so I got into there. And the result was I I kept up this habit of questioning everything, even when I finished the course. And I went off and I put a notice up in the local supermarket to say, I have to do 200 hours practice. Would you like to come and get hypnosis for free? Here's the number. And I got hundreds of people from that supermarket. And the deal was, I said, I would do it for free, but you have to tell me what I did wrong and what didn't work and what did work and what I could improve. That's it. Otherwise, it's completely free. And I got the most harrowing feedback back. And I realized that, again, most of the stuff I've been told to do, the public just did not like it at all. For example, when uh, a lot of people offer free first consultations, I discovered that my clients 
they don't want a free consultation. If they're coming for hypnosis, they want hypnosis and that's it. And they're not going to leave without hypnosis. So things like that, they don't teach in the courses, but are very valuable. Mm. But out of that, I said, I studied all this stuff and I began to read much, much more widely than just hypnosis. I began to read all about, I did two degrees in psychology, for about several years. And I decided to start going down every alleyway to, to where I could go and this stuff. And I, I tested all the theories, all the stuff. And I discovered that most of the problems people seem to have can be explained by looking at what their model of the world is. That if you understand the model of the world, you can begin to go forward and help them. And I came up with my own model of the world. And I now use that with every client. When I look at someone like you, I'm looking at how you're dressed, how you're sitting, how your hair is done, what you chose to wear, why you got those glasses, why you chose that background. All of this stuff is in for air. It all tells me something about you before you even open your mouth. And so, and I then listen to see if some of what you say fits my model or not, and where I can get that into. And that, that's basically what I, I got out of that first accidental way into hypnosis. The trouble was when I did it free, I, I did my 200 hours and said, well, thank you very much, took the notice down, and people wouldn't stop pestering me to do some more. Mm -hmm. And eventually said, I'll pay you. So, oh, okay, I'll try that. And it gradually crept into that, which is why I don't have a start date for being a hypnotist. When we think about the model that you have um, and how it relates to the mind and behavior, can, can you go into that a little bit more? Certainly. This, this, I think, is core to what I believe therapy is about. I believe that we have, we're imperfect beings. And you could argue that we have three brains. I don't like the term unconscious. It says Freudian overtrons and so on. So what I tell my clients is we have three brains. We have the frontal cortex, this bit up here that is logical and you think with. We have the alligator brain, the thing at the back, your brain stem, which looks after your blood pressure and grows your hair and all that stuff. That, that's out of reach. We can talk to the frontal cortex, but the thing in between, whatever you want to call it, is where we actually live. That's where we actually are humans. I don't know how we evolved that way, but that's what it is. So, so basically we have these three brains and the purpose of the middle brain, it has only one job and that is to protect you. It's sole only job and it only has one time and that is right now. It does not understand anything else except right now, right here, and my job is to protect you. And what it does, that middle brain, it scans the environment looking for threats. It does this by looking at the inputs that come in. You're listening to my voice. Uh, you can see the background, uh, the, the, the color of my cardigan. The, is any of this threatening? Your brain is going through there looking for something, some kind of threat all the time, 24 hours a day, even when you're asleep. And if it finds something, it then goes into its memory banks, it says, have I come across this before? Well, is this something I had before? And what was the result? And if the result was pain or anger or fear or whatever, it then goes and reaches for the lever that's, what did I do that time? And it does the same thing. And the more times you do it, the faster it gets with the lever until it becomes completely automatic. And so its purpose is to look for threats to the environment and to keep you safe. That's all it does. It senses threats, and then it applies the first solution it ever got that worked. And it never goes back and looks at the solutions again. I like to think of it as being, my brain certainly, is about a seven-year-old boy. We're talking about a child's logic here. Straightforward, simple, black and white. But more than that, it has very few words. You're, you're an experienced hypnotist, you know this is true. It works in images. It works in hardwired feelings and images and symbols. And that's 
all it does. That's how you have to talk to the world. Whenever you put someone into trance, you're saying, imagine walking along a sandy beach. You're using their built-in images of their memories, and they will come up, the mind will come up with whatever they were thinking at that time. If you're unlucky, they're going to say, oh, my feet are burning on the sand and I'm getting out of here. And your session's gone. But that's the risk you take when you go into the unconscious mind. It, 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 you don't know what you're going to get. And so you, you mustn't assume what's there. And that's one thing I, I try to do. And so that's, that's how I use that model. I'm aware that everyone is different and everyone has to be kept safe. There it is. Yeah. As a hypnotherapist, a lot of times they, you know, a, a client will come in and they think you're going to just uh, lie them down and fix them. And obviously, it's, it's not as simple as that. Do you want to explain a little bit about how you work with a client? The first thing I do with a client is give them a real good looking at. I start working the minute the client starts coming out the car. I'm looking at how they're dressed, how, how they're walking. What, what can I glean from that? And then I'm looking at what does this client say? What words do they choose? What words do they not choose? What are they trying to sell me? I'm terribly cynical. I believe that almost everyone lies to everyone else. We put up facades, we put up pretenses, and I'm thinking, what is this client pretending to me? And when you're sitting in my chair, I'm looking at you and I'm not seeing you. What I'm seeing is your mother and your father and your sisters and your grandma and your teacher and all the influences that are on your life. And I'm trying to figure out from your view of the world, how did these things influence you? What do you think about your mother? What do you think about your body? What do you think about your looks? All of these things have a, a bearing on, on the, the model we make of ourselves. And we act according to that model. We don't act on our thoughts. We think our acts. And so whatever you think about yourself is whatever you project. And it's a tenet of NLP that you cannot not communicate. And so I'm looking at people and I'm anxiously trying to get this communication. And a lot of my start was, hello, how are you? Did you park all right? And they think I'm having a conversation. I'm actually trying to find out what they're thinking about. Are they going to complain about it? Are they going to say this? And then I say, what would you like to have happen? And I usually get a bit puzzled. Eh? What do you mean? Said, well, what would you like to have happen? And then they go, oh, well, I'd like to stop smoking. I'd like to stop drinking. I'd, I'd like my sister to stop hitting on me or whatever. And that then tells you what their worldview is about. They believe they, they can't stop smoking. They, they believe they can't have a relationship with their sister and so on. And, and I begin to dig into that. And try and see, well, what specifically don't you like about your sister? And again, they will reveal another layer and another layer. And if I keep reflecting people using clean language, I keep reflecting back to people what they're saying. So you think your sister's a bit of a bully. Can you give an example? So what happened next? And, and as you keep reflecting back on them, people spend more and more time in their inner mind and they go into trance. You don't need a formal induction with most people. Mm. You just talk to them and get them thinking about the past, about themselves, about how they feel. And they disconnect the logical brain. And that's, by definition, trance. And so you get them in trance. Derivational search is, is what we call it, um, yeah. where a person just goes off and they retrieve that memory and they start to hallucinate it or experience it as if they're right there, right now. Like you were saying, there's a part that's of the right. brain that doesn't understand time, everything in its world is now. And so, yeah, as, as a therapist, as a hypnotherapist, um, obviously utilizing hypnotherapy, um, a lot of people get confused about hypnosis versus hypnotherapy. Um, you, you've taken a lot of time to really think about how you can work with that person and how you can support that person in a therapeutic way. Is there anything else you'd like to explain about, I guess, how you work 
so people out there, if they've never tried it before, it's it's not this big mystery. What else would you maybe like to normalize about the hypnotic process or the hypnotherapy process? What, what I try to do is to get every client to recognize that first off, I don't have any stupid clients. Every client does something for a reason. They think they love going abroad because they enjoy overseas travel and new sites. And I point out that actually, no, they don't. What they love going abroad for is to get away from the unhappiness that they're at right now. It's not, we don't get attracted to things. We get driven away from things. And I always say that every coin has got two sides. And when a client says, I want to stop smoking, I keep thinking, well, why do you smoke? What is the opposite side of that? And nobody smokes for stupid reasons. Why do you smoke? Although you know it's killing you, although it's costing you a great deal of money, it's breaking up your marriage. What is it that's so important to you that you keep smoking? And that's where I start with a client. I'm trying to find out what makes them tick. And if you accept my view of the inner mind as being there primarily to protect you, the question then is, what on earth is it about a poisonous, dangerous, expensive habit that is protecting you? What is it protecting you from? And the answer is, it's protecting you from feelings of, choose one of 10, inadequacy, rejection, feelings, not good enough, whatever. Things that you feel all the time, but that over thousands of instances, you've learned that if I take 10 minutes away from it and take a cigarette, I can deal with it for 10 minutes. And that's what you're doing. You're not, you don't like smoking. Nobody likes smoking. What you like is not feeling the way you felt before you had the smoke. And so the therapy then has to be, how, why do you feel you need a smoke? What is it about that? And that comes down to, where did the pain come from? If you're avoiding pain, where did it start from? And that's what I said, when I see you sitting in my chair, I'm looking for your mother and your grandmother and your sisters and the army and anything else that happened to you. Because all of these things affect us. When we come into the, this world, we come in as perfect, flawless little babies, a blank sheet. And then stuff happens. No one was born with procrastination. No one was born with a need to smoke. We get that way by the action of others on us. And the tragedy is that as children grow up, as soon as they begin to learn that they are not the center of the universe, that there, there are other things there, they have to make sense of a dysfunctional household. They have to make sense of, if, if mum's an alcoholic, one minute it's all lovey-dovey and kisses, and the next minute you're getting bounced off the wall. How does a child make sense of that? How does a child make sense of the fact that father's angry all the time and you can never do anything right? They can only make sense of it by saying it must be me. This wouldn't happen if it wasn't for me. Now, this is what I mean. Your, your brain is seven years old. This is a child's view of the world. But as soon as that sticks and it answers some questions, then that's exactly what it does. It does not change again. And if you're unfortunate enough to grow up believing that you're no good, that you'll always be rejected, that you, that if you put on an ounce of weight, you'll be thrown into something awful, and all the other things that people worry about, these all come from childhood. Some, sometimes nobody intends it. Sometimes it just happens. Sometimes it's deliberate. But the point is that we get pain from the fear of rejection. And if you go drinking, it turns the pain off. We get pain from things that happen to us during the, our life. Um, th this kind of view of the world explains a great deal. Mm. I, I had a, a client yesterday who was uh, about procrastination, couldn't finish it, her, her master's degree, just, just absolutely panicked, could not get near it. Mm. And when I took her in and started asking her, what she felt when she started about that, she started getting feelings up in her chest. And I work with them and I take them away. 
and then ask her, how does procrastination, how does that assignment seem to you now? Fine, no problem. If you go in and deal with the brain in the way it's designed to be dealt with, then it's quite simple. Now, you asked about hypnosis and hypnotherapy. Hypnosis is a process, not a thing. It's a process of putting someone into their own inner mind so that the, you transfer executive function from the frontal cortex to the inner mind. And it doesn't matter how you do it. You can do it through drumming and dancing. You can do it by getting people to breathe and relax. That brings on the parasympathetic system. Or you can do it through conversation. I'm a university lecturer. I, I, I sent thousands of people into trance. You're talking away and they're all sitting there looking out the window, empty, blank minds. They've gone. That You just bored them into trance. Conversational and, hypnosis is, is all around us. And quite often it's the very conversations that we've had with our parents, with the world around us that has shaped our belief in ourselves and yeah. the world around us. So, you know, I'm, I'm hearing a big theme here that, in, in your mind and how you've noticed things, all behavior is really to avoid pain. And if we can um, come to that understanding, does that mean that a person can begin to then resolve that? Yes. We all have thousands of facets of our personality. And so do your parents and so do your teachers and so does everyone else. When you're a child, you either accept or reject your parents or your teachers, or the values around you. They're, they're tiny, fine-grained things, but we there's nothing in between. And so we either take on our parents' values or we don't. And if your parent has spent all, all the time saying, you're never good enough, why didn't you get an A plus? You only got an A. This is rubbish. You just grow up thinking that nothing I ever do will be any good. And you then apply that to yourself. It's pointless. Why would I keep doing this? I'll just give up and smoke dope. That's where these behaviors come from. They're to get away from a pain. They're to get away from things like that. So if you look at, say, fear of flying, fear of flying, you know, where's the pain in that? No one is ever afraid of flying the first time they fly. They might be a bit nervous, but they don't have the actual fear. You don't get the fear until you've flown many times. And then something happens. The plane falls out of the sky. There's an engine noise. You just sudden fear comes up. And that in your mind, then your, your, your little boy inside goes, have I had this before? And goes looking for it, says, oh, yeah, that was it there. That's the time I was locked in the cupboard and I thought I was going to die. And it does whatever you did then. And it brings out the, the fear, which is to tell you to run away right now. Get out of this. That's how it keeps you alive. And it puts the lever back and forgets about it. But you are left now with a fear anchored on an airplane of being trapped in a cupboard when you were four or whatever. No amount of dealing with the airplane is going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. And so the your brain makes it so that you pass out on the way to the airport. You, go, you can't do anything so that you cannot go on a plane and it keeps you safe. That's what fe phobias are for, that it keep you out of trouble. And of course, you, you have to address the, the fear, not the airplane. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, I, we do in most things. So, so how do you deal with that? Let's say someone is actually having a fear of, of flying. How, how do you deal with that? Right. I start from the basis that it's to do with the fear in your inner mind. Therefore, that's where we have to start. And what I have to start with, in this case, what triggers it? What triggers it is the thought of going on a plane, which triggers a memory, which triggers a fear. Now, I believe in a polyvagal theory of uh, being, I suppose you'd call it, that we don't just think with our brain. We think with our bodies, with our feet, that, that your, cat, you, your stomach has got more nerve endings than a cat has in its brain. And we actually think all over. And so when you think of that being locked in a cupboard, something appears in your body that we can get to. So you've got a, a stimulus a memory, a feeling, something in your body, and that something in your body is represented by a symbol, a memory, a shape, something. 
We can only understand things in terms of something else. You can't describe anger to me except in terms of other things. You can't say what it is. We can't do that with any thought. And so if you are thinking of all those things, every time you get a fear, you get something in your body. So I get you to focus on something in your body. I will say, close your eyes. Think about you just driving to the airport. You've got to go there. Your sister's ill. You have to be there. What are you feeling? And they will tell me, I'm getting a, a panic in my throat. I'm getting a feeling. This is your body thinking. Mm. That's what it is. And so, oh, and, and I've got this horrible churning feeling in my stomach. And then I will say to them, and what's that like? Tell me, describe that thing in your stomach. Is it like a whirlpool or a washing machine? Or is it like hammers cry? Just what is it like? Some people say it's like a bowl. Some people say it's like, how, do you, how does it seem to you? I get them to go inside and think about how that seems to them. Forget all about the fear. They just, oh, what, what is that thing? And then they say, I don't know, it's like a washing machine. Oh, and is it going around in a certain direction? Yes. What colors are there? What kind of machine is it? What would you need to make that thing stop? Now, you, you've changed it from how do I stop fear of flying to how do I stop a washing machine, which is something you do know. Mm. And you could then say, oh, I could turn the electricity off. And then you're saying, can you do that? Describe to me how you do that. I so said, I'd get off off my knees, never mentioned knees. And I'll reach over and turn it off. And has it stopped? Can you open it? I've no idea what's going on in the mind, so I keep asking. Describe it. What's going on? And they say it stopped, and maybe they'll say, oh, no, I can't open it, so it's always going to be there. And I'll then say, could you imagine that washing machine being a bit bigger? But a bit bigger still? Yeah. And even bigger? Yeah. Can you imagine it smaller? And I get to imagine, change the parameters of the washing machine and then I say to them, that means you have control of that washing machine. But more importantly, you've told the washing machine it can change. And it's going to change. Just let it change. And their own mind will give them a dream of changing the washing machine until it gets so small they can deal with it. And then I usually make sure to destroy it so it never comes back. They can throw it down the incinerator or set fire to it or whatever, as long as it's gone. And that's how you use dreams to deal with people being stuck in a particular set of, think of airplane, have a panic. Think of airplane, have a panic. By changing the panic into something you can deal with, the next time you think of the airplane, you cut off the emotions. There's no connection. And you go, okay. And this works with any kind of phobia. Um, procrastination, so social phobia, not wanting to meet people, terrified of women, all this kind of stuff. So when you use the, the term dream, it's quite, kind of like a hypnotic daydream. So you're sort of helping them through that. And they're, they're leading a lot of it. And you're utilizing their story, yep. their, their metaphor. Or you give them a complete metaphor. A lot of my work is telling people stories. I will tell them a story about someone who is trapped in a bog and couldn't get out. And the person immediately thinks of this transdervational search. Have I ever been in that thing? And how did you get out of it? And you, you make a story which is isomorphic, which matches their own life story. And then you show this person who is in a bog got out of it by doing so-and-so. And their brain goes, oh, I could do that. You don't tell them directly anything. Mm -hmm. But in two or three days' time, they come across the problem and think, no, I got out of that one. And they just step through the steps and it disappears. This, this to me, is the, the magic of your brain. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by people's brains, the way, the way they think of things and what comes up. I had a client uh, yesterday who, had a, who couldn't stop eating sweets. And I, I trace it as down to whenever she's got a deadline, she just has to give, eat sweets. And the deadline came from when she was in college, that she had to get a deadline. And if she didn't do this, she would fail. And she has a picture of her father standing there going, you are a failure. I paid all this money for you to go to college and you can't even take the exam or whatever. Oh, and she goes and eats. And so I asked her, what is it like when you think of your dad and that? She said, it's like a big wooden box and I'm in it. That's how it feels. These things are real. Our brains actually produce them. Everyone is unique.
And so my job as a therapist is to see how can I get you to come out of that box and destroy it? And that's largely what I do is to use your own dreamlike ability. Remember, the purpose of dreams is to deal with unresolved things from during the day. If they're not resolved, then they come back again. You get repeating dreams. But they're always, I said, they're always metaphoric. And if it's something dangerous you can't deal with, it's called a nightmare. It's the same thing. If you join in the nightmare, you can, you can fix it. And so that, that's the, the kind of therapy I do. I also do straightforward hypnosis, but not, not so much these days. Mm. It's all about how did you get the way you are and how can I get you to get out of it? Nice. And, and some of these are very simple and some of them are immensely complex, particularly when you have two opposite beliefs. I had a, a woman I, I dealt with for months who, whose only way of dealing with feeling bad was to eat. She'd go to the cupboard and ram food into her face. And at the same time, she had a terror of fat. She would sit in my chair and look at her ankles and think, God, they're fat and horrible. Everybody hates me. I'm repulsive. Can I have a biscuit? Two opposite drivers. And that took a very long time to first to get to discover and then secondly to, to get her way out of it. I dare say a lot of people out there could probably relate to that where sometimes they are um, trapped in the cycle of behavior yeah. that they just need a little bit of support to get out of. And uh, this is what I like about our field. It can be extremely effective to assist people to, you know, overcoming all sorts of fears and phobias and behaviors and, and um, reactions to the world and come out the other side in a much more buoyant place where they can hop on that plane or they can ditch the sugar or they can kind of overcome whatever it is that's been holding them back. If someone wants to um, come and see you, Dave, obviously you're a member of the New Zealand Association of Professional Hypnotherapists, so we've got you on the directory there. Mm -hmm. But if they want to personally get in contact with you, what's the best way of them finding you? The best way is to get onto the website, wellingtonhypnosis.co.nz. So we'll put it from below. there. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And um, any final words of advice or anything you'd like yeah. to sort of share? We are therapists and there is a need for therapy. What, when I was talking about phobias and that sort of stuff, those are relatively straightforward social phobias. What does happen with people when, when you're brought up by badly trained parents? For example, to believe that you can never do anything right. It just whatever it is, it will never be good enough. That becomes what is known as a core belief. And you take this with you to work. You take this with you to school. You take this with you to the driving test. You just know that you'll never be good enough and you sabotage yourself in order to agree with that belief. And that sort of thing. And there are many of them. I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm unworthy. I'm. I don't have the strength to give up smoking. I never learn how to deal with these things. I, I have an addictive personality. All of these are core beliefs. And the point is that these are a different type. It's the difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is about what you did. It's about things and actions. Shame is about who you are. And if you believe that deep down inside in your very being, you are worthless, you cannot get that yourself. You need help with someone like you and me to come along and dig that out and to make sure we don't ruin anything else while we do it. Because the, everyone has four or five of these and they, they, they basically make your personality. And the other thing I would say is, I, I say this to every client, when you have a behavior, just stop and ask, what is it I'm trying to get away from by doing this? Gambling, what am I trying to get away from? The, design, the pokies are designed to be very active and engaging and so on, but that's not what you do. That's not what you're there for. What you're there for is to get your brain fully sucked into it so you don't have to think about how your mother makes you feel or whatever it happens to be. 
And the, the first step towards getting healthy is to recognizing what the basic problem is and not go chasing after things, but just ask, what am I running away from? Mm -hmm. And I think if, if people ask that, and the other thing I would say is that it's never too late to, good to have a good childhood. That is true. Just go back and change it. You're not doomed to have these things. You're not cursed yeah. forever. A lot of people, I think for a long time, believe that that was their lot or, you know, because I've had such a terrible trauma, I'm always going to suffer or I'll just have to, to deal with it some way and get through it. But actually, we can resolve a lot of that trauma. This is, you know, important to understand. Positive psychology, you know, hypnotherapy is, is part of that uh, toolkit and understanding um, and getting back to the root cause and resolving whatever that is in, in the way of the belief is going to affect the behavior and the emotional outcomes from there. So um, well, well said, Dave. When you do it right, the effects are instantaneous. Mm -hmm. It's not like counseling where you need 20 or 30 sessions. When I take away your fear of public speaking, it's gone permanently, instantly. It mm -hmm. doesn't come back. So you know, the stuff that we do really works. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> just thought more people should know it. Awesome. So thank you again, Dave. Um, You're it's welcome. been lovely to talk to you. And um, yeah, all the best. All right. Thank yeah. you very much. Bye then.